What are anticlines and synclines and how do they form? Take a piece of paper and push on both sides and you'll produce a series of arches and troughs. This can also happen to rock when it's under high temperatures and pressures. When folds like this occur in rock, we call them either anticlines or synclines. Now, to avoid confusion, always remember that the A in the anticline kind of looks like the structure. Anticlines and synclines have three basic architectural parts. The axial plane is an imaginary surface that runs perpendicularly through the arch or the trough. Adjacent to the axial plane are the limbs. Notice that connecting anticlines and synclines share a limb. The hinge line is the axis of the axial plane which tells you what direction the plane is facing. As you can see, the youngest rocks are always at the center of the synclines while the oldest rocks can be found at the center of the anticlines, and this is gonna become important later. Anticlines and synclines that appear in a road cut are easy to make out. But when the surface is eroded away and we can only view these structures from the top, things can get pretty confusing. Essentially, all you can see are the limbs of both structures. When this occurs, the geologist must depend on other information to know what's going on. Notice that the oldest layer is exposed at the center of the anticline. Notice also that the limbs dip away from the anticline's hinge line. But the opposite is true for the syncline. Notice that the center of the structure is now home to the youngest layer. The limb dip is also opposite that of the anticline. Notice that the limbs dip down towards the syncline's hinge line. So the dip of the limbs and the age of the rock are the two pieces of information that geologists can use to figure out what structure he's looking at when it's in a top-down view. Of course, geologic structures such as this do not act in predictable ways. Often, the layers within anticlines and synclines do not stay horizontal with the Earth's surface. These layers can twist in all directions. If the layers tilt like this, then the anticlines and synclines tilt along with them. These kinds of structures are called plunging anticlines and plunging synclines. Here is an anticline that is tilted with its hinge line now running into the ground. If this anticline was eroded flat, you would see this U-shaped structure at the surface. You know this is a plunging anticline because the oldest layer is at the center. Interestingly, if you were lucky enough to see this structure in side-on view, you wouldn't be able to tell that the anticline was plunging. Only the top-down view can give you that information. Now let's look at a plunging syncline. Once again, the hinge line is now pointing into the ground. If this syncline was eroded flat, you would get a reversed U-shaped structure. You know that it's a plunging syncline because the youngest layer is now at the center. And it doesn't matter which end of this structure you're looking at. Even if you could only investigate this end of the syncline, you would know that it's a syncline because the layer in the center is the youngest. Again, as with the anticline, a cross-cutting view would not tell you that this is a plunging syncline. You can only discover that by looking at the structure in the top-down view. Okay, so let's see how well you did. Pause the video if you need more time between each question that I'm going to ask. What is this part of this structure called? And make sure to tell me whether it belongs to an anticline or a syncline. What is this part called and what structure does it belong to? Now, if you said a syncline limb for the first question, you'd be correct. Good job. The correct answer for the second question is an anticlinal hinge line. Okay, so what structure is this? And what about this one? And this one? 
If you set a syncline, a plunging anticline, and an anticline in that order, well, you'd be correct. And if you got all of them correct, well then congratulate yourself. You're doing a great job. Okay, it's time now for our spotlight on creationism. Did you know that some rocks have experienced ductile deformation while being close to the surface? These sandstones in the Grand Canyon, for example, have deformed by as much as 90 degrees. The problem from a secular perspective is that this bending supposedly occurred more than 400 million years after the rocks were first deposited. But the sandstones should have turned into solid rock after only a few thousand years or perhaps as many as 10,000 years. It is impossible for terrestrial sandstones such as this to stay wet and pliable for 400 million years. Some might object and suggest that these rocks were exposed to high pressures and temperatures during that time. But when rocks are exposed to high pressures and temperatures, the grains in the rocks are heavily altered. This is called metamorphism, and this alteration is easily detectable. Yet these sandstones show no sign of metamorphism whatsoever. Now it is possible, given strain that works incrementally at the microscopic level, for bends like this to form over large time frames. Think of the rock compressed, but not heated, bending at just millimeters per decade or something like that. But evidence for this type of strain would be evident in the rock itself in the form of microscopic reorientations of individual grains. Yet these kinds of reorientations are absent from these rocks. And are we really to believe that strain tirelessly bends these rocks at the microscopic scale over tens of millions of years without any meter scale slippage. The Grand Canyon area has experienced five large 5.0 or larger earthquakes in just the last hundred years. Great big earthquakes like this cause massive fractures in the rocks. So how many 5.0 or larger earthquakes did the Grand Canyon area get in the last say 70 million years? That's when upward movement of these rocks supposedly began. Well, if you get five in a hundred years, that makes 3,500,000 earthquakes greater than a 5.0 on the Richter scale since uplift began. Does this bend look like it has experienced 3,500,000 large earthquakes to you? The simplest explanation is that these rocks were not rocks when they were deformed, but rather they were wet sediment. But that would mean that there were only years to millennia that separated the time of deposition from the time of uplift. Yet notice that from a secular perspective, more than 400 million years supposedly exist between these two events. These data, however, do not conflict with a young age creationist worldview that believes all these sediments are less than about 10,000 years old. Okay, so that is all from me here, Dr. C at Creation Geology for Beginners. Now, for other resources, don't forget to go to my website, www.creationunfolding.com. I have a book as well if you want to look for that. Uh, if you thought this video was helpful, then it would be incredibly supportive if you could hit the like button and subscribe, and of course, ring the bell as well. But you know what? I think the greatest support that you could possibly provide me would be prayer. So if you could stop right now and pray, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.